All right, praise the Lord. In fact, we were going to have a little video this morning and uh, that was going to advertise the fact that we need some more help with the tech team and all the equipment. Now you got to see it in person, amen? Got so much going on. If you'd like to help out with our videos and our tech team and our sound team and, and all that goes on, everybody look back at the booth, give them a, hand, a wave and a hand. They need more help. We've got a lot more going on with all the technology that uh, we're trying to uh, meet the need of the hour uh, with uh, reaching people uh, in person and online. So if you'd like to uh, be part of that, uh, let us know. Welcome again to Huntington Beach Church. My name is Jason Robertson, one of the pastors here at Huntington Beach Church. And, um, and, and uh, looking forward to this worship service. I've been looking around this morning. I noticed that we have some that are here that are uh, new and are checking out our church. And then we've got a lot of our members here. It's always good to see each week more and more people that are coming back in person. Amen. So, so good to have all of you here. And we're, we're thankful for uh, the direction of things that are happening, uh, not only in society, but in our church, most importantly. If you do, have your Bibles and turn with me uh, this morning to the book of Acts. The book of Acts as we continue our study through this book. We're going to be in Acts chapter number 19. And uh, this morning, boy, I tell you, that, that those last couple of songs um, were exactly what I'm preaching on. Uh, it is to talk about the faithfulness of God, to look at the way God works in our lives. And I'm so excited about what God's doing in our church, through our ministries, and the impact that we're having in our community. And so with those thoughts in my mind, I came to Acts chapter 19 in our next verses that we're looking at as we go verse by verse through this book, and it speaks directly to these topics. Now, if you have your app, you can uh, look, uh, go to Huntington Beach Church, go to that button, and then uh, you will see today's sermon uh, title that is there. So I want to show you something very interesting in the Bible today about the way God works in mysterious ways. Now I'm going to warn you, <laughs> I'm talking about strange and crazy ways that God works. And I'm not going to, this is not personal stories with me. I'm not here trying to entertain you. I'm literally going to read to you the scripture. And I'm telling you, though, I'm warning you, there is some crazy stuff in this chapter 19. I'm talking about it involves magical aprons and handkerchiefs. It, it involves exorcisms. It involves seven nude guys, seven naked guys running down the street after they talked to a crazy man who was possessed with a smart aleck demon. All right? I'm telling you, folks, this stuff is crazy. All right? It's, it's, it's strange and out of the ordinary. And, uh, and, and yet it's, the, it's right here in the Scripture, and it's here for a reason, and we're going to discover that reason this morning. So I want us to begin in verse number one of Acts 19, verse number one, and I want you to look at it. It says this, and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus, and there he found some disciples. Now, I want you to just recognize this morning the location of where this chapter is taking place. It's taking place in the city of Ephesus. Now, this city, you got to understand this city to really appreciate what's in the chapter. In fact, modern-day Ephesus looks like this. Isn't that pretty cool? Kind of looks like uh, some of the cities right here in Southern California, right? Except you got, <clears throat> you got the ports, you got the big uh, boats coming in, but it's a beautiful city, a seaside city. And that's the way this city was. It was beautiful. It was modern. It was the place to go. It was a destination spot. And so you can even visit it today and, uh, and actually look at some of the structures that were standing in the time that this chapter was written. For example, you, this uh, picture I've got on the screen here is the Celsus Library. 
This thing's still standing. If you take a tour to, to Ephesus, anybody want to take me on a tour to Ephesus, you know, you can sign me up. We'll get on one of those boats that we saw in the harbor, and we'll go over there and check this out. This is the Celsus Library. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is because this, there was only a few libraries in the Roman Empire. This was one of them. It's actually on top of a tomb the tomb of a guy named Celsus. Thus, it's called Celsus Library. And so it was on top of his tomb, and it's still standing today. But one of the things that absolutely blew my mind as I was researching this city was the theater in Ephesus. Look at this photograph. The theater was built, carved into the side of the mountain, and this thing was massive. In fact, do you know how many just, I'm, just in, a, in your mind, put a number in your mind of how many people you think they seat in this theater. And it might surprise you that the number is 25,000 people could be seated in this theater. So, again, just you got to realize this is 2,000 years ago that this kind of stuff was going on in that city. And so there were people coming there. It was the place to be. It was the place where you go and you see things and you experience things that just you can't experience anywhere else in the country. In fact, there was something even more amazing and more famous than these things I've shown you, and that is this. And this is sort of an artistic rendering now because it has since collapsed, the Temple of Artemis. Artemis is a, is a goddess, a Greek goddess. And uh, so they were worshiping a Greek goddess, Artemis, in this city. Uh, when the Romans took over, they, they uh, called it the temple to Diana, because uh, in their uh, religion or whatever you want to call it, uh, of, of studying gods and goddesses, they had a similar goddess to Artemis, and her name was Diana. And so when they took over the city, they kind of they conflated the two. So some called it the Temple of Artemis, some called it the Temple of Diana. But here's why this is important. I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not just giving you a history lesson. you got to understand this to appreciate the chapter. Because here in this massive temple, and it's, this thing's huge. Look at all those columns. There's actually 127 columns in this building. Each of those columns are 60 feet tall. And when you went in, there were these statues to... Uh, this goddess, and she was like one of these um, warrior women. You know what I'm talking about? So if you're into uh, uh, watching uh, the Avengers and all that kind of stuff these days, you know some of the movies are about these warrior women, right? She was one of those. That's where, that's where they got that concept. She was like a warrior woman and a, and a hunter. She carried a bow. She was strong. She was fierce. And, uh, but she was also then looked up to sort of as the goddess of fertility. In other words, she was the hero of all women. If you wanted to be pregnant, you would go there and, and make sacrifices to her. If you were pregnant, you'd go there and, and worship her, hoping that it would bless your child and things of this nature. And what's really terrible is I did some research on this uh, temple is that people would go there, and this is pagan. This is a pagan religion, right? Gods and goddesses. And, uh, and so in this temple, there were something called temple prostitutes. In other words, literally there were sexual activities going on in the temple as a form of worship. And so again, this is pagan religion. People would go in there and, uh, and, and be with these temple prostitutes as a way of worshiping the goddess Artemis or Diana. All right, so now you, you kind of get a feel for what we're dealing with here. Just picture 2,000 years ago, and you're some farmer or some fisherman. You've lived out on your farm all of your life. All of your uh, parents and grandparents and great-grandparents have been farming that same piece of land. You haven't seen anything. You haven't, uh, you haven't been anywhere. And all of a sudden, one day, you go to Ephesus. And you see this stuff, you know, you're not in Kansas anymore, right? 
I mean, you, you, see a, you see a theater that's been carved into the side of the mountain where 25,000 people without any sound system, without any electronics, is watching uh, entertainment and stuff like that. You see this temple that is built where people are in there doing things that you don't even, we don't even want to discuss, right? And yet they see it. You know what it reminds me of? This is kind of like ancient Las Vegas, Right? right? It's ancient Las Vegas. As people show up in the Ephesus and their eyes get this big and they're not sure if they ought to just turn around and leave, right? But they get intrigued and they get pulled into the city and it takes them into things they've never thought of before. And in the middle of all of this, there's a group of people that are studying the Bible. And it's a small group and they call themselves The Way. And uh, their most beloved teacher was John the Baptist, and which makes sense why they called themselves the way, because John the Baptist was the one who was clearing the way for the Messiah, right? So he was putting everybody on the right way to get ready for the Messiah. And so John the Baptist's disciples, his teachers, had made their way to Ephesus, and they had a Bible study group there. And they didn't realize that the Messiah had come, all right? Remember, even John the Baptist, when he met Jesus and baptized him, uh, later on, even kind of second guess. When, remember when John was in prison, he was like, is he really the Messiah? So his disciples didn't quite know that Jesus was the Messiah. They, they weren't full believers yet, but they were seeking him, and they were on the way to believing in him. And along comes a little old man to town, a little old man that had been around the block a few times in ministry and, and different types of things, and he, he, he's had a lot of miles on him. He's, he's kind of just, he's not impressive to look at, but uh, he's brilliant, and he's smart, he's good with people, and he knows the Bible, and his name is the Apostle Paul. And he meets with this group the way and he begins to share with them that the Messiah has come, the one whom John the Baptist baptized, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he begins to teach this group, and he's trying to build a church. The Apostle Paul was trying to build a church in Ephesus, and he was starting with this group called The Way. But things weren't going too well, unfortunately. It was a hard city to build a church in. You could imagine, right? You could imagine trying to build a church in a culture like this, trying to reach people in a society like this. So look what happens in verse number 8. Talking about the Apostle Paul, it says, He entered the synagogue for three months and spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way. So in other words, when people started uh, pushing back, arguing with Paul, refusing to believe in Jesus, they even took it a step further and just started began to speaking terribly, speaking evilly about this group the way, just putting them down, just ruining their reputation and uh, being obstinate toward this group. And so when they started speaking evil of the way before the congregation, Paul withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. Now, this is interesting. So, Paul takes his group, and he moves over. He, get, he starts in the synagogue. So, as Paul always would do, he started with the religious people. He's figuring these folks ought to know the Bible. They ought to know the Old Testament. They should be ready for Jesus, but they weren't. And many of them got mad and angry and rejected Jesus. So Paul took the ones that had believed, and he found a different location. He's going to plant the church in a building in town, a building owned by the name of a guy called Tyrannus. Now, by the way, Tyrannus, the root word of that is the word tyrant, tyrant, all right? So this is probably not the name that his mother gave him, right? Nobody would name their kid tyrant. 
And you might would call him that at about age two or three, right? But maybe that's when he got the nickname. I don't know. Or maybe it was in his life, he, he just became known in town, most likely, as sort of a, sh- a, a shyster. He was a tyrant. He probably, uh, w- they probably referred to the way he did business. Because here he is owning a hall. So he's like a, he's got property. He's got real estate. And he became known as sort of the local tyrant. But it's obvious here that something radical has happened in this man's heart. Because now he is letting his building be used by the Apostle Paul for a church plant. So we see one person getting reached, a difficult person, no doubt, but getting reached. And they're in this hall, and it says they're in there daily, in there every day. Some translations believe that the word were used for daily actually referred to that 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. time of the day, which in ancient uh, culture like this, when there was no air condition, that was the hottest time of the day, when, and most people would take off work during the middle of the day, and so what was happening is when people would get off work in the middle of the day for a siesta, they would all kind of, those who wanted to, go down to the hall, and there every single day, the Apostle Paul is teaching the gospel. And watch this, the next verse, verse 10. And this went on for two years, every single day, for two years, so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that he had touched that he had that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. I told you this stuff gets crazy. I mean, here you've got these magical handkerchiefs and aprons and you got exorcisms going on where demons are coming out of people. For two years, Paul, who's planting this church, gets involved in some things that really you don't seem involved in anywhere else in the book of Acts. But here it is, I'm telling you, it's off the charts. Some strange happenings that are taking. I told you, it gets weird, but it gets even more weird. Watch this. Let's go to the next verse. It says, so some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, so they're like gypsy Jews. They're like gypsy uh, traveling itinerant preachers. They, they went around and they were exorcists. They would drive out evil. That was their gig. You know, if you know somebody with a demon, these guys would show up in town and they'd do their thing. And it says they, they probably weren't having very good uh, success because they're actually fake guys. It's a, it's a scam. And it says, so they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. Watch this. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. See, they don't believe in Jesus. They're scam artists. But they heard about this guy, Paul, who was having success down at the Hall of Tyrannus. And, and man, I mean, people, I mean, he can, touch, he can send them a, a handkerchief and it runs off the demons. And so we want in on that power. And so they said, all he's doing is naming this dude Jesus, whoever that is. Let's name him, right? And it says they, they, they use the name of Jesus to command the demons to come out. And then it says they are called the, the seven sons of Sceva. Kind of reminds me of one of Pastor Chris's old punk rock bands. You know what I'm saying? The seven sons of Sceva are in town. Everybody wants to go see the seven sons of Sceva, these traveling exorcists coming to do their miracles, but they but they they're they're totally fake. In fact, this is one of the first things I want to draw out of this text for you to remember. Write this down. Our enemy can't create. They can only counterfeit. Our enemy can't create. They can only counterfeit. But here's the, there's something you got to, there are, the, the enemies out there. There's a lot of fake out there. And they're, they're making a living, which means they get an audience, which means people pay for this kind of stuff. But they're fakes. They're counterfeits. The world is filled with that. 
Some of you are looking for help and hope and spiritual healing. You better be careful because there's a lot of counterfeit help and counterfeit hope and counterfeit spiritual healing that's out there. I mean, Christianity and the Lord Jesus is right now offering you holiness, right? I mean, that's what Christianity offers you, holiness. And yet the world comes along which can't give you holiness. In fact, it rejects holiness. And so the world will say, well, we can give you happiness. And a lot of us are like, happiness, that's cool. I'll take that, right? But it's fake. Happiness doesn't last. Holiness in the Lord lasts. Happiness is just something that's so temporary. It looks good and feels good at first, but it's going to go away. Christianity says, we offer you the love of God. God wants to, he loves you, and he wants you to know his love, and and Christianity will teach you about true love, what it really means to love God, and and, and learn how to love even yourself, and learn how to love people around you, and, and the world comes along when it's counterfeit and says, well, we can't give you that, but we can give you lust. Lust? Lust sounds fun. (laughs) You know, everybody, hey, lust, wow. It looks good to the eyes. It's pleasing to the the body. It's going to meet that felt need in my life. And so people will buy in the lust instead of going for the true love that Jesus Christ offers. Or it's kind of like relationship. We are here at Huntington Beach Church offering people real, genuine, authentic relationships relationships with God and Jesus Christ, relationships with Christian people. These relationships will literally change your life. It all begins with actually a relationship with God himself. That's what being saved and becoming a Christian is really all about. The world can't compete with that. So the world says, we'll give you religion. Yeah, we'll give you religion. You know, the difference between religion and relationships, one, religion is just a list of do's and don'ts. It's a list of this is what you got to do to earn your way to salvation, which is a lie. You can't earn your way. But religion will give you all these rules and all these parameters so you'll feel good about yourself and you'll feel like you're making a difference when all of it's counterfeit, friend. It's a lie, and it leads to total destruction in your life, whereas Christianity is offering you a relationship. I just wanted you to see that. This is, this is the culture, the society that this chapter is taking place in, and it just parallels so perfectly with our society today right here in our city in Huntington Beach and the surrounding cities, you see. They're planting this church, and it's very difficult. And along come this counterfeit group, And they're getting a big crowd. And they're going around trying to cast out these demons. And everybody's watching these guys because it's the seven sons of Sceva come to town. And then this happens. Notice verse 15. And one day the evil spirit answered them. Uh Uh-oh. One day the evil spirit answered them and said this, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, most likely, the children over in Children's Church won't be taught about this story today, all right? This is not the kind of story in the Bible that you get a coloring page for, right? Right? Here you go, kids. Color in the seven nude guys. That, that's not going to work, right? Make, don't leave out the blood. All right. no, see, it's not going to work. It's one of those crazy stories in the Bible. I mean, just crazy. On top of everything else that's already happened in this chapter with the handkerchiefs and the aprons and, and the exorcisms that are going, right? All of a sudden, these guys, they get pounced on by this demon-possessed man And, uh, (laughs) I mean, it just goes nuts. But I want you to realize this this morning, because here at our church, we don't ask you to show up on Sunday just to be entertained with a neat story. We're here to study the Word of God and have God speak to us. Amen? And so, I want to remind you that these stories in this chapter are not in here just so you will learn about a neat story. 
They're in here because there is a reason that they're in here. God doesn't waste his ink. There's a, there is a lesson that he's trying to teach us. And so I began to ask myself, what is this about? Is this chapter about how to exercise demons? In other words, you know, you get a lot of ministries that get caught up in that, and they, they start talking about exorcism. Is this the chapter you go to to learn about how to do it or, or maybe learn how not to do it? I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot about demons in this chapter. I mean, you, 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 you're reminded that they're real. I mean, I'm sure some of you out there may not even believe in demons. You may not even believe in a real Satan or devil. You think all that's mythology. But I'm a Bible believer, and it says right here, these things are real. And I also, I'm a very interested in the fact that these demons all knew who Jesus was, right? And that's not surprising. Why? Because what are demons? They're fallen angels. They were created by Jesus himself. Jesus is God. So here they, way over here in the city of Ephesus, a long ways from Jerusalem, these demons knew Jesus by name. There's something there to remind us of this spiritual realm that we don't see, that's very real, and they know each other, and they all know who Jesus is. And if Jesus is uh, in the room, these demons are ready to, to, to obey him. We know Jesus. And I also like that they said, and we also know about that Paul guy. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we, we've heard about him lately. Yeah, he's, he's with Jesus. He's one of Jesus' guys. And I, th I just thought that was kind of cool, you know. I mean, probably the highest compliment Paul could ever get was from a demon, right? I mean, could you imagine somebody saying, well, I know Jesus, and, and, and I know Huntington Beach Church, right? Oh, that'd be awesome. I, I hope they know our name in hell. Amen? I do. I think it's incredible. But is that what the chapter's here for? I don't think so. Or maybe, maybe is the chapter here because God's wanting to teach us how to use magical aprons? <laughs> you know, no. Of course not. In fact, you remember the text up there where it said these were extraordinary miracles. It means miracles are all right, already out of the norm. These are out of even the norm for miracles. Probably the only time this stuff ever happened. So that stuff you see with the televangelists who say, you know, send me $100 and I'll send you this prayer cloth. He got that from this chapter and he shouldn't have. Because this chapter wasn't here to teach us to do this as a ministry. That guy that's asking you to send you the $100, he's a scam artist. He says, I'll pray for you and you'll be healed if you send me $100 when I send you that prayer cloth, right? I've always wanted to write back and say, why don't you pray that I get healed? And if I do, I'll send you the $100, right? I bet they won't do that. But see, there's always people trying to make money off of this kind of stuff. They abuse the scripture. So I'm telling you, I don't believe that the, this chapter is in here to teach us about demons. I don't believe it's in here about, to teach us about miracles. So why is the chapter here? And I believe the Bible tells us in the very next verses. Read them with me. It says in verse 17, the story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. Now watch this. A solemn fear. This is the fear of God. This is respect, mad respect for God descended on the city and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. And I like the words there, it descended on the city. It was, like, it was like it came down from heaven, this awesome respect and reverence and fear for God came down on the population of ancient Las Vegas. It came down on all these people like all at once. And watch this, many who became believers confessed their sinful practices 
a number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them in a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. And if you're reading in other translations, it'll say they're like 50 thousand pieces of silver but what you got to realize is those silver those added up to like a yearly wage and when you piled all that together had it been our day and time and our currency so so figuring in inflation it was like several million dollars worth of resources and merchandise was piled up publicly in the city and set on fire and then it says this so it means, so in this way, in this way, so in this crazy, out of the ordinary way, the message about the Lord Jesus, the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe right there you see why God put this chapter in the Bible. Why he let us read all these crazy stories. This is the point. The point is sometimes God does some way out of the ordinary things to get his work accomplished. How out of the ordinary? Well, I mean, he might throw us Seven Sons of Sceva Revival. You know what I'm saying? That out of the ordinary. The Apostle Paul had, was literally, the Apostle Paul was in town. The greatest Christian preacher maybe ever in history was in town, in person, and on stage every single day for two years and wasn't getting much accomplished because it was a difficult town. But he kept preaching, he kept teaching. It was every single day, every single day, right in the middle of the heat of the day, he would preach and he would teach. And even though there, were no, there was not much fruit to talk about and people weren't getting saved as much as you would think. In fact, the only ones that were were these weird things where God had to actually send magical handkerchiefs over here or, or, or some type of weird thing over there. And you're thinking, why did he do that? You see, God, who's working at all times and is wise and, and is way smarter than us. Can I get an amen? God knew that this was the language of the people. Crazy was the language of the people. God knew if you're going to reach crazy, you got to get a little crazy. So he did weird, crazy, abnormal things in this particular city because that's the language they spoke. I mean, don't forget, they went to their church to meet prostitutes. This is crazy stuff. You see? He, God knows how to get people's attention, which reminds us this morning, write this down. It is our job to share the gospel. It's God's job to open people's hearts. Amen? Yeah, we don't have to compromise the gospel. We don't have to come up here and do gimmicks. We don't have to come up here and put on an entertainment show to try to reach our city. That's not what he's called us to do. There's churches out there that do that and get big crowds, but I think a lot of it's counterfeit. What I believe is that you just, we just got to stay by the stuff. We got to keep going forward. We got to do what God's told us to do. And that is preach and teach the word of God. Amen? That's what he's called us to do, to love people, to evangelize, to pray. He gave it all to us right here. And some people say, well, you know, it's a different generation. It's not going to work. You know, you can't do it like that. Oh, you know what? That's what probably some were saying to Paul. But he just kept at it, and he kept at it, and he kept at it. And behind the scenes, God was like, I know exactly what I need to do to reach the whole city. And you had these counterfeits popping up. 
which had to be very aggravating and disheartening to the way and to Paul and to the new church because they're over here growing bigger and faster with all these crowds and all this cool stuff going on. It's just like in our church. You know, we've got Pastor Jordan in the house, amen. Pastor Jordan's got our youth ministry and Gen Z, right? Listen, the world has so much stuff out there for youth now. I mean, when I, you know, I was, I remember what the society was like when I was growing up. Some of you are older than me. You remember, I mean, just think about how much there's out there now in society for young people and youth, programs everywhere. There was a day when the only group in town doing anything for the youth was the church. But now there's a lot of stuff in the world. The same way with, you know, we got a recovery ministry now. At our church, there's a recovery ministry. Hundreds and hundreds of people come to our church each week to go through our recovery ministry. But the world's got recovery ministries. And we've got a small group fellowship here with our life groups and people getting together. But the world's got plenty of clubs and things like that you can get involved in and meet people. So the question is, why would anybody come to a little church like Huntington Beach Church? Why would they come here when they got... When there's bigger and better stuff, it seems like, out there. This is the kind of thoughts that creep into the minds of some pastors and church staffs. And it causes them to be uh, tempted to compromise and say, well, we got to compete with the world. We got to do things a little bit. We got to, you know, we can't be so biblical. We can't be right out in their face with the gospel. We got to, you know, we got to pull back on these things. Because, listen, they've got all that out there. But, see, I want to remind you this morning There's a reason people will come here, and that's because eventually they're going to realize that out there is counterfeit. It might look bigger and better and fancier with more bells and whistles, but it's empty, and you know it because you've been out there. It's empty. The difference here is this is real. This has the Holy Spirit. God is here The gospel is real. We've got to keep by the stuff. This is what the Apostle Paul did. He didn't compromise. He didn't quit. And one day, God opened the eyes and the ears of everybody in the city, and there was a great revival, a great revival. God knew what he needed to do to reach these people. And, you know, it made me think about all the different things that people want out of God. You can write these down. I think some people want God who's a cosmic Coke machine. You know what I mean? You just put in your prayer and out pops your blessing, right? And some people want a God who's a cosmic life coach, right? A cosmic life coach. In other words, they they quote scripture. They got all their little cool uh, scriptures that are their favorites that that pump them up and make them feel good. They they turn the Bible into like a success thing where where you know I've got all these promises that are gonna make sure my business goes well and I stay healthy and I, I'm successful in life. And God is always there. He's got my back. And if I'm in trouble, He's gonna show me what to do to get out of trouble. It's God's a life coach. But you know what, folks, that stuff's counterfeit. A lot of churches being built that way, but it's, it's garbage. It's not real. You want to know what real is? Real is what happened in this town where they met the only true God who is, and I, I underlined it, the Lord God. The Lord God. What do I mean by that? Look back at what happened in this town when they got right with God. It says, and I'll put it back up here on the screen for you. It says they confessed their sinful practices. Confession. And a number of them who had these books burned them in the public bonfire. Millions of dollars worth were burned up. You see, this is real Christianity right here. This is the real thing. Honest confession. Actively repenting. Active repentance. Active. I mean, how active? They didn't just say they, it wasn't just I believe. No, it's I believe and I'm going home, I'm cleaning out my closet. I'm getting all this junk out of my house. All this stuff that I got out in the world that I've been putting my faith in and my trust in. And they got all their books and all their trinkets and all their little statues of the goddess Diana and all this junk. And they piled it up out in the, and it's public, by the way. 
This isn't, oh, I'm, I'm going to church now. I'm going to church. Don't tell nobody. No, no. They went out into the public, and they got right with God. And it was sacrificial. It cost them something. They didn't come to church saying, what can God do for me? They said, no, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do for God, who's already done everything for me that he ever needs to do when he died on the cross for my sins. You see what I'm saying? This is real religion, not the fake stuff. And when God brings revival, when God opens a person's heart, when, when you preach the Word of God and teach the Word of God, and this is what Paul had been doing. None of this, this revival couldn't have happened had Paul not been out there planting the seeds and, and, and the people in the town had heard about it, but they just didn't believe it. Even the demons had heard about what Paul was doing in that church plant. But then one day God said, okay, it's harvest time. And it reminds me, folks, that God is always working. He's always faithful, Will, right? He's faithful. He's faithful. He will keep his promises. If you keep doing what he's told you to do, no, don't look at the results. Don't get frustrated. Don't get impatient. Be faithful to the word. Be faithful to the gospel. And when God gets ready to bring the harvest, he will do it. And when he does it, he'll be the only one that gets credit. Amen? And if he has to, he'll use a smart aleck demon to do it. Right? I think that's just funny. I just think that's hilarious. I mean, a smart, like, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Right? And that brought revival. God's like, yeah, look at that worship service. Right? Blood's flying everywhere. Clothes are coming off. Naked guys running down the street. Woo! Holy Ghost revival. Paul's over in his church looking at his staff going, uh, we didn't think of that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right? God's thinking of things we can't think of, folks. And he'll use anything, anybody. In fact, he even used the devil himself to bring revival. I want to close with this verse. So I've been preaching to my church right now. I've been preaching to you this whole sermon to stay faithful. Amen? Amen. This worship team, these church planters, stick by the stuff, preach the word. But I want to speak right now in closing to those of you who maybe are here checking out Christianity. You're seeking God. You're looking for faith and salvation. I want to close with one passage, and this one's for you. And it kind of flows out of the concept of this chapter. And it's in Matthew 7, 21. And this is Jesus himself speaking, and notice what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons? And in your name, perform many miracles. And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, that's Jesus personally giving us one of the most solemn messages in the Bible that addresses this whole counterfeit thing. He said there will be some on judgment day that will even walk up to him and call him Lord. In other words, they talk the right talk. They know all the religious lingo. They'll point to things that they did in their life that was religious. In fact, try to compete with these people. They cast out demons and did miracles. Have you done that? They must be more spiritual than you. So they point to all this stuff they've done. They're very spiritual. They talk the talk. They, they, they've been in church. They've been active in ministry. And yet Jesus said, no, 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 no. Only the ones who do the will of my Father are getting in. Now 
Now that causes some of us to think, wait a minute, I thought calling him Lord and serving him is the will of the Father. Well, you see, there must be a way to call him Lord and serve him that's fake. It, it, there, must be a, there must be a sense in which you can say the right words and even do the right things and you're still a counterfeit. That's scary. Because what Jesus is reminding us is that there's something that the Father wants that is deeper than your words or even your actions. He wants you. He wants your heart. That's what he wants. He wants a relationship with you. He doesn't care what you say. He's not impressed by what you do. What he wants is you. And if he doesn't have you, your heart, if, if, you're, if you're not really, truly sold out to him in your heart, if he's not your only thing, if he's not your one true God and Savior, then it doesn't matter what else you're doing. You're just playing. You're going through some motions that, you're, that somebody sold you, and it looks right and it sounds right, but it's fake and it's counterfeit. And so I'm coming to you today, friend, not to judge you or condemn you. I'm coming here out of love to say, man, listen, if what you have right now is anything short of a relationship with Jesus Christ, then what you have isn't good enough to get to heaven. You say, well, what do I do, pastor? It's simple. It's simple. It's a shame nobody ever told you. That is, you need to be like these people in that city. Confess honestly. Get right with God. Get honest and genuine with God about who you are. Confess that you're a sinner in need of him, asking for his mercy and his grace. Repent of the sin in your life. Get rid of all that other junk that you're trusting in and all that stuff you're doing, even if it's religious stuff. Get rid of that in your life. Put it away. Put it aside. Get on your knees. Open your Bible and talk to your God and creator who loves you. And I'm telling you, friend, nobody's ever reached out to God with confession and repentance and God ignore them. He doesn't do it ever. He will open your heart. He will come into your heart. He will save you and become your God and Savior the moment you do that. And it'll be real. And you will know it's real because the Holy Spirit of God will come into you at that moment. You will, it'll change your life. It'll change your life forever. And it won't be something you've done. It'll be what God is, has done. That's what our church is about. People all in this congregation, that's happened to them. And you know it. And they've come here and we've baptized them to make that event that happened to them in private and we make it public by baptizing them it's a public way of saying i've given my life to the lord i'm the old me is dead and buried that's what baptism is we put them under the water they're dead and buried they've been resurrected with jesus christ they belong to him and he belongs to them amen and you can have that today let's bow our heads Right now in the quietness of this moment, I just wonder if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. If he's convicting you of your sin and your need to be saved. I'm asking you right now, what keeps you from obeying the Spirit of the Lord who's calling you to salvation today? What's keeping you? What's holding you back? What are you afraid of? Because I tell you, friend, you don't need to be afraid of God. You say, well, this is going to cost me. Oh, what, I'm telling you, what, what you think you have is, is worthless anyway. All that we have in this world is going to burn up one day, friend. Why don't you give it up now? And receive him. Maybe somebody says, well, I, I, I grew up in church. I got baptized. I thought I was doing it all the right way. But in your heart of hearts, you know that there's an emptiness there, that it's not real. When you pray, you don't sense God's presence. When you read the Bible, it doesn't make any sense. It just hasn't connected yet. What's the problem? The problem is you've got religion, but you don't have Jesus.
But if right now in your heart you will talk to him. He's talking to you. Talk to him. In your heart say, Lord, Jesus Christ, I want you to be my God and my Savior. My Lord and my Savior. I'm a sinner. I can't offer you anything. I'm just a sinner. I need your grace. Please forgive me and save me. Take over my life. And in your heart of hearts right now, you don't have to say this stuff out loud because I want you to be honest. Start naming your sins. You know your sins. You know that stuff in your life. It's evil. It's immoral. It's selfish. It's destroying you, and you know it. Give it up right now. Ask God to take it and burn it out of your life. Ask him to remove it out of your heart. Ask him to forgive you of those sins and to cleanse you. And ask his spirit to come into your heart right now. Our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I've done what I can, Lord, as your voice, peace, uh, just a preacher, a pastor, to just stand and preach the word. But God, our faith right now is not in me. It's in you. It's in the Holy Spirit that's working in this room and even hopefully with people online in their living rooms or wherever they are. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak so boldly and loudly and get the attention of people that there would be an impossibility for them to ignore you or run from you any longer. God, I pray you speak louder than all the voices in this world, all the counterfeits in this world, all the demons in this world. I pray you speak and shout loudly above all of that and share your love and your grace and your peace and your hope in your son, Jesus Christ, who is the only Savior. And God, I also want to pray for the people of Huntington Beach Church. That as the going gets tough, we stay to the grind. We stay faithful to the calling. We keep our hand on the plow and we keep moving forward, trusting the Lord of the harvest will one day bring forth a harvest to his glory. What we must do is be faithful to preaching, to praying, to loving, to fellowshipping, to evangelism. That's what you called us to do. And we're, we, God, need your help to keep doing it. But I pray we never get tempted to stray off into other things in this world. But we trust you to build your church and your ministries and to reach people with the gospel. Lord, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.